Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yesterday saw the conclusion of an international gathering in Glasgow that some claimed was, quite simply, the conference that either would or would not save the planet from destruction. You will all, I am sure, have read, watched or listened to various reports and heard words from expert scientists, world leaders and activists, all with their own emphasis on what was being discussed. John Kerry, for instance, spoke of the world being closer than we have ever been before to avoiding climate chaos and securing cleaner air, safer water and a healthier planet. But of course, other voices were less calm. The Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, spoke of our fragile planet hanging by a thread. We are still knocking on the door of climate catastrophe. And a government minister for the Maldives, when speaking about what had been agreed, simply said, it will be too late for the Maldives, which given that 80% of the country's islands are just one meter above sea level and may well have disappeared into the ocean by the turn of the century, that may not be an exaggeration. For us, living on this vast American landmass, that's almost impossible to imagine. Even as someone from Britain, I can barely get my head around such a situation. But for the Maldives minister, this mind-blowing sense of total destruction was very, very real. And Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. In the 13th chapter of Mark's Gospel, we find some of Jesus' closest friends and followers having a similarly mind-blowing conversation with Jesus about catastrophic destruction of a different kind. Not in this context, the kind of destruction that has been talked about in Glasgow these past two weeks, but destruction that will come through both war and natural disaster. And as the last words of that gospel passage remind us, that's merely the first sign of trouble. As Jesus puts it, this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Read on through this extraordinary, terrifying chapter of Mark's gospel, and you will hear Jesus speak of deep division and hatred. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And that perhaps also has a contemporary resonance for political division and extreme ideologies are a growth industry in the Western world at present. You can see that being acted out on the border between Poland and Belarus. In my mother country, you can see the scars of deep divisions and hatreds that erupted over Brexit. And in a week which has seen Steve Bannon charged with contempt of Congress for failing to obey the subpoena which demanded he testify about the events of January the 6th, we are reminded that such divisions have grown enormously in these states, which feel perhaps not quite so united as once they did. And Jesus is in no doubt that division leads to deep suffering. Such has not been seen from the beginning of creation and never will be, he says. Deep suffering compounded by no shortage of false messiahs and false prophets. Again, a phenomenon we might recognize in those who continue to claim, for instance, that the result of last November's election was fraudulent, or those who speak out against COVID vaccines for various highly dubious reasons. All in all, 
says Jesus, there's a lot of bad news happening, and it isn't going to stop anytime soon. All in all, there are some very valid reasons for being really pretty miserable, which is where the curtain rose on what you might call the first act of our trilogy of Bible readings this morning, when we encountered Hannah, a woman not facing global catastrophes, whether caused by human or natural events, but a woman nevertheless with good reason to be deeply miserable. Hannah's story was not seemingly a story of global or national importance. She was simply the second wife in a, po in a polygamous household that was deemed perfectly acceptable in this period some thousand years before the birth of Jesus. But in a culture where children were seen as a blessing from God, something which is just as true today in the Middle East, Hannah's lot was far from happy. Despite her husband's bland hope that he might be more to her than ten sons, Hannah's situation was miserable. Goaded and taunted by the other woman, Hannah has acquired what we would recognize today as an eating disorder and is clearly deeply depressed. Depressed because, apparently, the Lord has closed her womb. But while Hannah might have wept unconsolably and stopped eating, she was nevertheless determined to do something about her plight, to do something to make a difference. As the text of 1 Samuel makes clear, in the era in which this story is set, it was believed that God had closed her womb. Not, I hope, a belief that you share. The God of love we see personified in Jesus is not, I believe, a God who delights in doing things which harm or hurt God's children and God's creation. But Hannah lived in a world with a different mindset. And so she does something appropriate to her situation, something, however, that had not been done before and which, in the culture in which she lived, was audacious in the extreme, especially for a woman. Hannah does something which I hope all of us today would so take for granted that you may not immediately see the remarkable, radical nature of her actions. Put simply, and using our own contemporary terminology, Hannah went to church to say a prayer. But what you need to realize is that such a thing at that point was not the commonplace behavior that it would be today, which is why the corrupt and hopeless priest of the Lord, Eli, is so bemused and indeed angry at her actions. For a start, religion was really a male affair. That won't surprise you, for even in a denomination of Christianity as liberal as the Episcopal Church, it's only comparatively very recently that women have been allowed to minister as priests and bishops. Jump back the best part of some 3,000 years, and we are in an utterly patriarchal society. But Hannah's actions are more than just an early example of female leadership. Hannah turns up to the temple of the Lord in Shiloh, this story being set well before David conquers Jerusalem and his son Solomon builds the temple there. And not merely does she pray to God, she demands to make a deal with God. Give me a child and I'll give him back to you, she bargains. And in that act of dialogue with the Lord, she does something in its way unprecedented, in the religious history and practice of the Israelite people. The temple was a place of sacrifice. It was a place, it was the place, where one enacted out the Torah, the laws or rules that dictated how you could have a right relationship with the one God. But it wasn't a place to cross-question God or demand from the Lord what you wanted to have happen intercessory prayer, so normal for us today, was not part of the formal religious landscape in the days of Elkanah, Hannah, and Eli. So, 
if God had closed the womb of a woman, so be it, but not for Hannah. Did Hannah have a belief in the love and goodness of God that had convinced her that God didn't do bad things to people? Or did Hannah simply think it was all down to argument and negotiation? We don't really know, but what we do know is that being a woman deeply troubled, Hannah turns up to the place believed to have the best access to the one God, sort of the place with the strongest religious Wi-Fi of its age, and she implores God to look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant. Or, to use the language of the writer to the Hebrews, which we heard in our second reading, Hannah possesses confidence to enter the sanctuary. And she does so with a true heart in full assurance of faith. In other words, many centuries before Jesus was conceived, Hannah, like Jesus, understands and acts out a belief in the nature of God's goodness and love. And thus Hannah comes to discover that the bad news, which has surrounded her for years, is not the final word. For God hears and God acts, and God shows Hannah that ultimately, where God is concerned, there will be good news. And of course, if you read on to chapter 2, Hannah then sings a song of rejoicing that is the very clear inspiration for a remarkably similar song we find on the lips of a pregnant virgin some 900 or 1,000 years later a song which has been glorifying God at the center of Christian worship ever since. For in her Star Trek-like approach of boldly going somewhere unprecedented, where no man, let alone woman, had boldly gone before, Hannah teaches not just Christians, but all children of the one God an important lesson about perseverance in prayer and confidence in what we Christians call good news. And that's worthy of a sermon in its own right, but as the author of the letter to the Hebrews understood very clearly, if you have confidence to enter the sanctuary, this has consequences, which is why he wrote, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, For he who has promised is faithful, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. The one God was faithful to Hannah. And from the story of Hannah comes not just the roots of the Magnificat, but comes the prophetic ministry of Samuel, whose influence on the history of the Israelite people, and thus on us, the people of a new covenant, was enormous. Hannah's determined efforts to pray and to hold the one God accountable indeed provoked love and good deeds, and in doing so sets an example for us, an example that is increasingly vital in a world which seems in so many ways to lack both love and good deeds and revel all too much in hatred, in division, in violence, and in deeds that are bad, if not downright evil. In this morning's Gospel, we heard a lot of bad news on Jesus' lips. The temple will be destroyed. There will be wars. There will be earthquakes. You will be flogged, imprisoned, put on trial, betrayed by your family, quite possibly executed. People will need to flee as they face literally unprecedented suffering, false prophets, messiahs, teachers will arise and try and mislead everyone. And read through to the end of chapter 13, for to round it all off, when all that has happened, as if that wasn't more than enough, then after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. 
It sounds like it's going to be game over. It sounds like after a whole lot of bad news, the climax is even worse news. Except, of course, it isn't. You all know the bumper sticker. There are no guarantees, even from God, that this life will be a life of undiluted success, pleasure, or happiness. We live in a broken, fallen world where bad things happen. Many of these bad things are of human origin. Some come from the natural order. This world is both complex and broken. But for all that, as Hannah knew, as the author of Hebrews knew, and as Jesus himself knew, God is faithful. And the end of the story will be good news. For then, Jesus says, when people presumably will be at their point of greatest despair, we will re be reminded that God does not desert God's children. For as Jesus tells his closest disciples, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, gathering together his chosen, which some Christians think is code for a holy huddle of like-minded people, but which I think simply means everyone God ever chose to create in God's image. In other words, whatever awful things life throws at us, whether of human creation or the natural order, God will not desert those whom he has chosen to create and to love, for he who has promised is indeed faithful. And in the meantime, if, like me, you think the world could do with better news than it so often gets, whether in terms of the climate emergency, the divisions of Western society, the never-ceasing gun violence on the streets of this, our city, or anything else, then learn from Hannah. Turn up, pray, and then consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Don't think you'll always be thanked for it, as the Reverend Al Sharpton found on Friday when one of the prosecutors in the trial around the killing of Ahmad Arbery wanted him banned from the courtroom, stating, we don't want any more black pastors coming in here. But I'm sure that Pastor Sharpton knows full well the need to show this precious but broken world that the one who has promised is faithful. And because of that overarching piece of good news, we all need to play our part in the bargain and make this world a better place so that the Maldives do not disappear into the Indian Ocean, so that Western society does not disintegrate into division and animosity, so that hate-fueled racist crimes do not go unpunished so that some of the streets of Chicago cease to be in the grip of gang-related gun violence, and so that us and all God's children may understand and live out lives that provoke love and good deeds which turn bad news into good. For that is Hannah's world-changing legacy to us and to all the children of the one God. And now it's our turn. Amen.